Continuity is one of those things that we have known how to describe intuitively for several millennia, but we didn't have a precise mathematical way of describing it until like relatively recently. We're talking like 19th century. Aristotle basically broke down continuity as something that if you take limits from the left and the right, then they must touch. And he also believed that continuity meant if you kept dividing something, there will always be ways to continue dividing. This second part stands in contrast to the Greek philosophy of atomism, and that's not really a topic that I know much about. Taking limits and making sure that they agree though, that sounds like the definition of continuity straight out of calculus. Uh, though what exactly Aristotle means by limits isn't described mathematically. That took up until the mid, say, 1800s. There have been a lot of different takes on continuity, some local and others more global, and I want to talk to you about them today, and more than that, I want to tell you about the continuity properties of what we call the popcorn function. So what is the point of continuity exactly? Well, it, on a practical level, for any function or signal, we can only take a finite number of samples, and we would like to be assured that in some way, these measurements represent some underlying function. A continuity means nearby inputs should give nearby outputs. If a function took only random values, then any particular sample wouldn't tell us anything about the other points of the function. Sort of how looking at winning lottery tickets doesn't tell us what the next winning number is going to be. The precise definition of limits themselves wasn't worked out until the 19th century. Uh, before this, Lagrange in 1799 published his uh, theory of analytical functions. It, it was in French, I can't pronounce any of that. In there, he set out to remove Newton's infinitesimals from calculus. Lagrange's answer to the removal of infinitesimals was to express every function as a power series. We know this works for sine and cosine, the exponential function, and many other functions. Uh, to Lagrange and many others, this algebraic approach to calculus made a lot of sense. In fact, the way I generally think of continuous functions are functions that can be well approximated by polynomials. This isn't really too different from Lagrange's approach, except that power series tend to be more rigid objects than, say, an arbitrary polynomial. In the 19th century, Day. in the 19th century, we discovered functions that were, what, yes. Uh, hey guys, can we, can we just stop? I was recording. I'm recording. Hi. Yeah. Do you want to be in the recording? Yeah. What's plus three plus four? It is seven. That's right. Uh, guys, I'm trying to record. Here, can you sit over there in my chair? And just, or somebody, just sit. And you guys be quiet, okay? In the 19th century, we discovered that functions were more complicated than we previously realized. And even some infinitely differentiable functions can fail to have power series representations. And this really shook analysis and mathematics for a long time, and we realized we really need to take a closer look at what we meant by function. Let's top popcorn. If you cook popcorn on the stove, the precise position where they pop and spring up is unpredictable, as is their precise height or their jump. But there is an upper bound at least. We know that popcorn isn't going to just pop out beyond the ceiling or the lid of the pan when, it, when, when it's covered. When mathematicians named the popcorn function or Tomei's function, uh, perhaps they were a bit hungry. This is a function that is continuous and zero at every irrational point, but discontinuous at every rational point. For each rational point, if we reduce that rational number to a simplest form like a over b, with a and b having no common divisors, then the function outputs 1 over b. So. Here I have the popcorn function. Uh, we haven't done one of these MATLAB videos in a while, and so I just figured it'd be fun to just have even a few lines of code up here. So here we have, uh, I'm, n is equal to 50. What n represents is the largest denominator that I'm gonna have. So b is my denominator uh, for my plot, so I have a over b here. And I'm basically gonna be running through one to 50, and then I let a go from one up to b because I don't want to look at anything past one. You can, it's perfectly valid, but I just want to keep a nice compact plot. What I do then is I basically take a look at the greatest common denominator between them. I'm trying to see if this is a reduced irrational number. And so if that happens, I just plot one over b at uh, the a over b point on the line. I put hold on here so I can just keep adding them one at a time, sort of like popcorn, pop, 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 pop. And yeah, and then I put a pause here just so we can actually see it happening. Anyway, so then I put the hold off at the end and that's it. And so it's a double for loop, pretty easy. And so I can just push play and we can watch it pop. And so there you go. This is the popcorn function. 
uh, all those points that we're seeing added one at a time, that is sort of our popcorn popping. And it ends up being this sort of nice triangular shape, and this is actually a periodic function defined over the real line. It would just keep copying and pasting this over and over again. At each one and every one of these points, though, it is actually going to be discontinuous. And where it is going to be continuous is actually at the points that aren't plotted at all, because computers can't plot irrational points. And at all those points, it would be zero. So it'd just be flat zeros all on the bottom of this graph. And so this is a popcorn function, a Tomei's function, however you want to call it. Maurice Frechet, in his dissertation, spent several years figuring out the right definition of a metric. He wanted to take the work of, say, Weierstrass and a bunch of the other guys who came up with topology and continuity over the reals, and he wanted to extend this idea to other spaces, say, spaces of functions. But to do that, he needed to have something that generalized the distance between points and the real line, and he wanted to define what is called a metric. This would allow us to talk about continuity beyond just real numbers, and he had to figure out the right definition. He knew the identity property and symmetry property are things that he really wanted early on. It, the identity property means that if the distance between two points is zero, then they have to be the same point. So that's pretty obvious that you would want something like that. The symmetry property says if you take distance between, say, x and y, and then you take distance between y and x, those have to be the same. It shouldn't be further to get from one to the other. But the last important property of metrics, that being the triangle inequality, took him several years. His first version said that the distance between x and z should be small when the distance between x and y and y and z are both small. And certainly this is true if we have the triangle inequality, but it didn't turn out to be strong enough for the theory that he was trying to develop. He wanted to take notions of calculus of a real variable and transport them to the calculus of variations, where you need to take derivatives of functions with respect to other functions. Frechet set out to prove a version of the arzela scoli theorem, and when he did this, he finally stumbled on our current notion of a metric with the triangle inequality, and he arrived at a generalization of a notion of topology on the reals. And then someone else stole all the credit. So in order to get the intuition behind why they call it the popcorn function, I think it's actually instructive to actually just pop popcorn on the stove. Now, I mean, it's I've never done this, and it's probably not advisable to do it uncovered on the stove, but uh, yeah, could be fun, and uh, let's see how much of a disaster this actually turns out to be. It looks like corn. Yeah, it is corn. That's exactly what it is. Do I maybe turn that popcorn is corn? Alright, so while the popcorn is popping and the stove starts heating up, I can tell you about today's sponsor, and that sponsor is Brilliant. Brilliant provides a great way to learn new skills through thousands of lessons from everything ranging from calculus to basic programming. Brilliant has lessons that'll help you upgrade your skills and move at your own pace through apps on your phone and your tablet and even through the browser on your computer. I personally have been using Brilliant to learn Python. When I first learned programming, I learned C and Java and all these other languages, but Python just wasn't available. Most mathematicians outside of academia actually have to code as part of their job. And you actually have to be pretty decent at it. And one great place to start is through Brilliant and its lessons. If you want to learn more about Brilliant and give it a try, then you can get started with a 30-day free trial. And if you're one of the first 200 people to sign up with Brilliant through brilliant.org slash that math thing, then you'll get 20% off of an annual plan. All right, now let's see if uh, we can get this popcorn going. <laughs> so I have this thing to hopefully like catch. I, I, don't, I don't know how, I don't have a plan. Um, and if things get out really out of hand, I just can cover it. But yeah. But yeah, so the, the popcorn function actually kind of works like this. So I mean, like basically, if you think of all these places on the pan as rational points in, I guess, the unit circle, then basically each of those rational points, you know, are going to be reduced to being from A over B to 1 over B. And so that could be really this high, it could be this high, it could be this high, this high, and so, and without really seeing the entire structure of the function, it can seem like they're kind of random. And that's kind of how popcorn kind of pops. It's actually taking longer to heat up than I expected, but I also didn't want everything popping all at once, so hey, uh, I guess that's a good thing. Anyway, I, I've never popped popcorn like this before, it's a little anxiety provoking. Just the slime. Oh, oh, one popped. You know, it was less of a hop than I expected. Oops. Oh. <laughs> that was cute. That was so cute. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> there's, there's no catching them. <laughs> Got it.
<laughs> and popcorn. Oh. All right, so why don't we actually talk about the, the mathematical popcorn function? So when we insert metric spaces, what is the definition of continuity we have? And essentially, what we are making sure in the definition of continuity that I'm going to tell you is that if we make a small wiggle in the domain of a function, the range can't make any large jumps. Uh, that is, small wiggle here gives a small wiggle there. Now, just as pretty much with anything in analysis, we start with an epsilon greater than zero and we put a bounding box around a point in that range. If we look at the input for that point, we should be able to put a small box around the input to make sure that, that we stay within the box of the output. That's continuity, but we don't have to restrict ourselves to reals. With Fourchet's metrics, we can put a ball or a neighborhood around an output and look for a corresponding ball or neighborhood around the input. What we see is that this is a very local property, not a global property like you would get from Lagrange's program using power series. And using this definition, we can quickly verify the discontinuity of the popcorn function at the rationals. Now, remember, we know that for any rational number, we can get arbitrarily close with an irrational number. If that rational number could be expressed in reduced form as a over b, then we know that the output is 1 over b. And so we can set our epsilon to be, say, 1 over 2b to take that down by half. Now, we want the output of our function in a small neighborhood to be within that 1 over 2b, if that was our epsilon. But we know no matter what the delta we select, we can always find an irrational point that is within that delta distance of a over b, but also maps to zero. The output is gonna be outside of that one over two b radius that we set, and that violates our continuity definition. Hence, f isn't continuous at rational points, but the continuity at irrational points takes a little bit more work. Hey, by the way, if you like this video so far, then if you wouldn't mind, just click the like button. Uh, it'll tell YouTube that uh, you know you like the video and that it should send the video to more people like you. And so I would really appreciate it and uh, it would help you know get my video out there. Okay, let's get back to the video. All right, so here's a scoop on Maurice Frechet. He was a mathematician who got his PhD at the turn of the 20th century by finding a good definition of metric space, which I told you about. At the same time, this gave us topology for things other than the real numbers. And that includes open sets, compact sets, it, which he can coined the name, by the way, and all the other good stuff. Now, less than a decade later, Hausdorff wrote his book on set theory. It was a huge moment in mathematics where mathematicians declared set theory was finally established as a real mathematical subject with the publication of this book. Hausdorff also gave us our full general definition of topologies there uh, in terms of neighborhoods and sort of blew away Frechet's work in this regard. Hausdorff did something that made everybody forget about Frechet and it wasn't just his definition of topology. Hausdorff changed the name from Eckhart's, which is what uh, Frechet called his metrics in French, in favor of metric spaces, uh, but the German word for it. I really can't pronounce it. I don't want to offend any of my German audience. And then Hausdorff forgot to cite Frechet in that same section. So he changed the name of the object and he forgot to cite Frechet. And so that's sort of a double whammy which sort of led people to not realize that Frechet might have been behind this idea. Now, I want to emphasize that I have no reason to think that Hausdorff was trying to steal credit from Frechet at all. Uh, from all indications, Frechet and Hausdorff had rather positive exchanges. The consequence, however, when the Borbaki group was putting their work together, they heralded Hausdorff and hardly mentioned their friend and colleague Frechet. Frechet got really upset about this and claimed that Hausdorff himself had admitted that he was building on Frechet's work. But we still barely mentioned Frechet when we introduced students to, say, metric spaces and analysis. In any case, I have a historical article linked in the description if you want to see more about Frechet's work and the drama around metric spaces. Hausdorff did start the modern approach to topology as we think of it today, and he gave us an even more general definition of continuity, which I'll tell you about in a second. But let's finish up the popcorn function. So now let's pick an irrational point, say r in 0, 1. We want to show that this function is continuous at this point. We know the popcorn function returns 0 there at least, and if we we're going to show that this function is continuous at this point r, then for any epsilon greater than 0, we need to be able to find a delta greater than 0 such that for all s 
within delta of r, the popcorn function evaluated at s is within the epsilon of zero. So if we take a look at the epsilon greater than zero, that means by the Archimedean property that there is an integer m such that m times epsilon is greater than one. Hence, one over m is say less than epsilon. Now we have a more concrete target, not just epsilon, but a particular reciprocal of an integer to get under. What we are going to do is collect all the rational points in the interval zero to one and find out which map to values larger than one over m. The thing is, there are only a finite number of rational numbers that have an output that is bigger than m. And once you find those, you just need to make a neighborhood about the irrational points small enough that it doesn't include them, which you can do again by using the Archimedean property of the real numbers. Hence, we know that any real number in that small neighborhood is not going to be mapped to a value larger than one of ram, since we purposely excluded all the rational numbers that, that would. And the irrationals all map to zero. Hence, we have shown that this function is continuous at irrational points. Now, the most general definition of continuous functions comes from the field of topology. And ultimately, its definition subsumes all the previous ones. We say that a function that maps between two topological spaces is continuous when the preimage of every open set in the range, or codomain, is open in the domain. Since we can define open sets and metric spaces as those sets that have only interior points, uh, this definition works there too. And so Hausdorff's ideas of open sets and topology really won the day here, but that's probably a video for another time. In the meantime, I would like to thank you for watching this video, and I hope you have a great day.